flexibility in terms of the things that you do, but to also make sure that all of this stuff works together so that your contractors can get off the job without having the problems. What you're going to hear from Steve this evening is really a vision for the future that I think is very, very exciting. So for all of us, the, the industry that we're in, uh, it, it just, um, you know, fasten your seatbelts because here we go. So with that, I'd again like to thank you all for being here. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica to introduce Steve. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Margaritas and Lights. Um, we all know how busy you are, so we're so privileged you would take a night off with some of us and learn a little bit about LED lighting. Um, I have the privilege tonight to introduce you to Steve Lidecker. So let me go ahead and tell you a little bit about him. Steve Lidecker is the Senior Vice President of Acuity Brands Technology Lighting Solutions Group. With more than 30 years of experience in the lighting industry, his current role involves advancing digital lighting to achieve its full potential. Steve holds a Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He is an inventor who was named on more than two dozen utility and design patents and other intellectual property. Um, some of those topics are, I'm um, sorry, luminary design, controls, digital communication, LED color changing, and renovation techniques, just to name a few. Um, would you all please help me in welcoming Steve Lidecker. Thank you, Jessica. Can you all hear me back there? Uh, tonight we're going to talk about evolving better solutions with LED lighting. And this is an AIA accredited presentation, and uh, you can all have copies of it after. But uh, we're going to talk about some of the technical aspects of lighting in terms of uh, color temperature, color rendering, and, and move on to some brand new technologies um, that just changed the game completely, as Vern indicated. <coughs> With LEDs, we're seeing a tremendous transformation in our business take place. I was talking to Douglas a little bit before. The first thing we always talked about with LEDs was life, their endurance, lumens over life. 
And then the discussion became around lumens per watt or efficiency. And the topic of economics or lumens per dollar comes into play. And LEDs met those thresholds for this transformation to take place. And we're seeing a tipping point faster than we've ever seen uh, in the 30 years that I've been in lighting. And Acuity continues to raise the bar on efficiency, on the economics of LED solutions, and then how long those solutions remain in application and in use. But if we just look at those things, I think we've missed a huge opportunity that LED can bring in terms of its ability to enrich our environments, to enable new functionality in terms of the electronics and the infrastructure that's present, and then to enhance our world in ways that we're just beginning to find out. When I talk about enriching the environment with LEDs, we'll look at three aspects of, of light and lighting and, and how they affect us. And as, as we know, we're all visual beings. Most of the information we get from the world around us comes from light and our ability to process that. Colors and color quality is a huge aspect of that. On the technical side, there's the Planckian locus, so the black body curve. The blue boxes, trapezoids, are uh, the ANSI bins that LEDs get put into. The magenta circles are seven-step macadam ellipses that are used by the DOE standard related to compact fluorescent. Seven steps is a huge amount of variation. So we'll see tremendous difference between a fixture that's in one quadrant up here versus another. The threshold of human perception is around three mechanicalipses. And so well, well smaller than that range you see there. To bring that into practical terms, this is one ANSI bin of LEDs at 3,500 degrees Kelvin. In the industry, we talk about bidding subtle shades of, of color that will appear in each one of these boxes, 16 of them, eight below the black body curve and eight above. Now, as a manufacturer, we would perhaps ideally love to buy right in that area. Okay. But that's not the case of what's available. This is one circuit board right here with 42 LEDs. We produce about 20,000 or more of these a month with 42 LEDs, so you're looking at almost a million components a month. That'll drain these bins if I choose in too narrow a section. So what we do is choose from a variety of these bins and integrate the output over that board to pull it into a three-step or imperceptible white color range in the center of that, of, the, of all 16 of those bins. What that means is that white to white, fixture to fixture, we have consistent output, even though the chips that are the foundation of that are not totally consistent. And while this looks like an easy math problem, I'll choose one in the upper right, one down below, one over here, it'll pull to the center. Each one of those bins also has a different lumen output, and a different forward voltage, and a different power consumption. So to hit the power consumption, the white point, and the lumen output, you need to very carefully blend those LEDs together, and pull that into the center, and meet your wattage, as well as your lumen output requirements. In terms of color, the old standard was what was called color rendering index. So it was a series of eight pastel colors. And this did particularly well at determining how fluorescent rendered an object, whether it rendered it naturally or not. When we take those eight color swatches, we assign a number to all eight. So when we talk about a lamp or a light source with an 80 CRI, that's an average of those eight 
80 colors. So they might all be rated in 80, or the first six might be rated in 100, and the next two have practically nothing in them. Okay? That would also give you an 80, but that light source would look very different than one that was equally weighted across those 80 colors. And would look completely different as if I had all my values you know, in the first four versus the last four. With LED, we've expanded that to now 15 individual uh, color swatches to add the primaries, especially R9, which is a deep red color. Why is R9 important? Sorry about that. <laughs> Keep me straight. <laughs> Why is R9 important? The deep, deep red. Uh, it's an important color, especially in, in meats and things like that. If we're in a restaurant, we want to make sure that we render that properly. There's another way to look at, at color, and that's with what we call gamma area index. Okay? And gamma area index uses the CIE color space from 1976, where each one of these areas is equal in terms of its lumen value and lumen rating for the eye. And we take those 15 color points and put them into this color space. And the larger the area, the more vivid a color will be rendered. So bringing these points out from the center makes a very vivid color experience. Not a very natural color experience, but a very vivid color experience. So to apply these two metrics to common uh, lighting tasks, the most critical ones uh, are what I call the three F's, food, faces, and furnishings. Okay, that's where the light needs to render properly. So CRI is a great metric if you want to properly render fruits and vegetables and make them look appealing, especially the R9 characteristic that you'll see there. Gamma area index creates a very vivid color experience where colors pop it becomes a very memorable scene. In the area of faces or cosmetics, color rendering is extremely important. That's why less than 5% of the cosmetics today are bought online. It's a personal shopping experience that involves light and how that light interacts. We use color in a lot of different ways. To highlight architecture, I think it's a little early, but the top of the Empire State Building uses saturated colors and dynamic patterns to draw your attention to the building. And we see that as a very commonplace exterior today. Another way to look at dynamic color is in the white spectrum. Okay, so just like the solar color temperature changes during the day from warm amber colors in the morning through cool colors in the afternoon, we can change the spectrum as well as the intensity of light. This is a simple method of looking at both intensity, the ability to dim up and down, as well as the ability to modulate color temperature on one slider. This is the way an incandescent lamp works. When we dim it down, it gets warm because the black body radiator shifts in temperature. And the light is very appealing. As you dim it down, it gets warm and it's very natural. We can do the same thing with LED by changing the color temperature of the LEDs and the intensity simultaneously. Another way to look at the changing of the white point is to have a separate control for intensity one slider for intensity and one slider for CCT. Now, at a given intensity, I can choose any <coughs> CCT I'd like by varying the components of the LED of the uh, drive current to, to bring out those different colors. Why might we want to use these techniques? Again, if we look at uh, in, the, in the merchandising environment, 
Uh, this dress that the woman is wearing uh, might be chosen to go to an afternoon party, or it might be chosen for the office, or it might be chosen for an evening out. All three of those lighting environments and color environments are different, and providing a user interface that allows that to be shown in the best light is a very effective way to merchandise. In a classroom environment, warm temperatures are great for collaborative environments between teachers and students. Cool color temperatures are great for focus and delivering, uh, delivering a topic from the front of the classroom. While these things look relatively straightforward, um, there's a lot of complexity that's involved. A simple slide dimmer, we can get a resolution of about 1% mechanically. And with intensity, the eye barely sees a 5% change. Right? So by having just a simple slide intensity, you can easily choose a light level that's correct. Anybody realize how many colors are on your computer monitor screen? The screens we buy today uh, have 24-bit color. 24-bit color is about 15 million different colors your computer monitor can show. So I said on one hand, we can see 1%, and we can't see 1% change in intensity. On the other hand, we're very particular about color. 15 million colors on, on the typical video screen today. Because your eye is a much better color meter than it is in a luminance speaker. So these luminaires here in the back actually have a 24-bit color channel on the top, a 24-bit color channel on the bottom, and if we added tunable white, it would have a third 24-bit channel which is a 72-bit number on each fixture. Anybody want to guess what 72-bit so, is? Uh, I mean, you, you know I checked for the show. <laughs> it's uh, 4 times 10 to the 21st. It's really close to uh, high school chemistry, which is Avogadro's number, or 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So a lot potential configurations in one luminaire. Okay. So what we need are tools to be able to manage those colors, much in the way we manage the colors on our video screens today. So color pickers that allow you to choose uh, hue, saturation, and luminance, or CMY, or RGB space. Simple sliders that allow you to choose color temperature, delta UV, or the chromaticity of the light, as well as intensity. So take the problem and simplify it by the user interface. Don't give somebody four billion or four trillion choices. Make it easy for them. I mentioned uh, that the eye is a better color meter uh, than, a, than a judge of intensity. And as we look at Measured light versus perceived light is very interesting. As an industry, we like to talk about dimming to 10%. Well, when we talk about 10% dimming, that's as the light meter will read it. So it's a 10 to 1 contrast ratio. The eye actually sees that as 32% perceived light. So when we talk about 10% dimming or 100 to 10%, the eye will see that as very little change. So you'll see it that uh, looks like about 30% at the bottom, not 10. If we dim to 5%, which is very suitable for energy management, the eye sees that as 22% of the original intensity. It's related to what we call the square law. Driving that farther down, dimming to 1%, is perceived within the space by the eye as being about a 10 to 1 contrast ratio or dimming from 100 down to 10 percent. So to get true performance dimming, you need to look at dimming down to 0.1 percent. 
Anybody want to take a guess? You go down to the Lowe's or Home Depot and buy a rotary dimmer. Seven dollar rotary dimmer and a fifty cent A lamp. What what does that combination dim down to? It, it can dim to off, but at the lowest intensity, it's point zero six percent. So for six bucks, seven bucks, you can get a system that dims a lamp down to less than point one percent. LED should deliver the same. So when you want to dim for high performance and you want to dim for aesthetics, you need to be down at these, at these low levels of 0.1%. And you need to be able to fade from that level to off very, very smoothly. And within this curve right here, it's very important that that be smooth and continuous. Because your eye may not see much uh, of a change down here, but it sees a step function very, very well. So that if you have any steppiness in, in the light output, it'll be perceived immediately as a jump. So to get a very smooth dimming curve in this area, you need more than a million individual steps in the digital system. Steppiness is a little bit different than flicker. When you step, you're making a change and then you're holding at a point. With LED, flicker is becoming more and more a part of the conversation. And flicker is when the light modulates in intensity and when the human in the space perceives it. This is a chart that was done by the LRC at RPI uh, where they rated the amount of people that would object to a certain amount of flicker in the space. Obviously the red is bad, our favorite source, metal halide and high pressure sodium up there in the upper left. What that's saying is that HPS has an 80% flicker at 120 cycles per second. And most people find that objection. Metal halide, about a 50% flicker at 120 hertz. Our friend warm white fluorescent T12, about a 20% flicker at 120 hertz. One of the things that happened when we went from magnetically ballasted T12 to T8 fluorescence is that things that happen in the office with T12 no longer happen. You know, a lot of eye strain, a lot of headaches. Uh, people would get migraines from, from the flickering light because Flicker can cause physiological uh, changes to people in the space. Uh, flicker is one way that photosen uh, photosensitive epilepsy occurs with low frequency, below 70 cycle flicker. Migraines and uh, loss of visual productivity happen in the less than 300 hertz range. So we're looking at industry standards on flicker to make sure that our office environments remain productive uh, and that we don't in introduce physiological problems with flicker. An incandescent lamp through its entire dimming range ends up at about 10% flicker in a very gentle way down here at 120 hertz. The best LED systems are up in the three, 4,000 cycle per second range and don't have flicker perceived Another way that we look at flicker is what we call stroboscopic flicker, and that is having a moving object in the field with a flickering light source. Everyone drive down the highway at night and see the hubcap spinning in reverse. That's our high pressure sodium with its strobing light source and a moving object. And so when an object moves and a source flickers, you'll see multiple images of that object. And those multiple images can be very, very distracting if you're in the space. Anytime you see a sharp vertical edge and you move your eye past it, you can see multiple images of that. Or when your eye performs what's called a saccade and moves from one quarter to the next, uh, the lights can actually flicker multiple times in there and you can lose visual tracking. So flicker within the space, both directly perceived flicker and stroboscopically perceived flicker, uh, 
uh, is important to eliminate. One of the natural attributes of an LED is related to its distribution. Right? Most of our light sources today are omnidirectional, in, uh, except for LED. LED comes out in a direction, and we can work with that direction. The first uh, systems that were developed around LEDs, existing luminaire manufacturers used to put LEDs into old forms, shield them very well, but now we can actually put them into new forms and direct the light exactly where we need it. So here's a store that's lit with fluorescent perpendicular to the merchandise so that it properly illuminates the merchandise along the aisle. But with LED, you can run a single row down the center and focus the light exactly where we want to right on the merchandise. So unlike fluorescent, where up at the top, uh, you know, imagine yourself in a warehouse store, up at the top, we're lighting the boxes really well, 20 feet off the ground. Uh, but down in the selling zone, between seven feet and four feet, uh, very little light. With LED, we can tailor a photometric distribution and provide high light level through the entire selling zone without distracting glare on the floor and actually drop the light level on the floor. Because the last time I checked, they weren't selling floor tile in this store. They're selling on merchandise. And you can see that the color rendering is much better here second photo as well. When we look at a, a luminaire and its electronics today, we look at it very, very differently than we did a decade ago. Today, more and more, we're integrating controls and sensors within our luminaire. So it might be an occupancy sensor or it might be a daylight sensor and that can be located right in the fixture so it can sense the light that's directly below it and it can sense the people in the space. We also can put energy storage in the fixtures and in the event of a loss of normal power, this fixture can turn on at a reduced intensity and provide half of egress lighting. We have intelligent algorithms that instead of the lumen output of a fixture degrading and diminishing over time, it holds it steady. And we can put a network interface into the fixture so that fixture can communicate outside of itself with its peers in the room or with other switches and sensors in there. And by combining the strategies that you see there, we can achieve up to 50% additional savings with LED lighting. I started in the business uh, in the, in the mid-1980s. For those of us who were in the business then, we were designing interior spaces to four watts per square foot. <laughs> so your uh, T12 magnetic ballast, two by four, 192 input watts. Pretty big budget, right? I wish we had lighting power densities like that. Uh, in the 90s, T8 lamps started to come out. Three watts per square foot. Then came two watts per square foot. Then one watt per square foot. Now our best designs today are at half a watt per square foot. You think about that, that's an order of magnitude almost 10 times more efficient per square foot than we were just 30 years ago. Compare that to the mechanical industry who hasn't changed much from World War II, and we've come a long, long way over the last 30 years. Well, what makes this a particularly interesting problem in the controls world is what I call the law of diminishing returns. So back in the mid-1980s, when we were offering controls, controls could save 50%. That was two watts per square foot. That was a big deal. Now, look at it. At a half a watt per square foot, controls save 50%, and they're saving 0.25 watts per square foot. So a lot, a lot different in its economics today than it was a few decades ago. 
The other law of diminishing returns with controls is having multimodal controls or controls layered on top of other controls. For example, occupancy sensing and tuning savings and daylight harvesting and time of day control are not additive. In the same way, half of a half isn't zero. If each strategy saves me 15%, I don't save 45%. I save 1 minus 0.85 cubed or 39%. So more strategies don't necessarily mean a, a linear addition of savings. So first we get to magnitude changes with the efficiency of the fixture, and then second is Strategies don't add, they multiply together. So we look today to create a very tight network of controls and electronics within the fixture to minimize the cost of the controls and to more widely deploy those controls without necessarily having contractor labor to put a sensor on the ceiling when we can put that in the fixture. Finally, Let's talk about ways that LEDs can enhance the world around us in ways that we're just beginning to learn. First is networking these fixtures together, in this case with a simple Cat5 wired network that connects sensors to fixtures to daylight sensors to control of the wall, allows us to have simple individual fixture control in this case, to highlight the front of the classroom or drop the light level in front of the classroom down while maintaining enough light for note taking. In the case of covered parking, we see a great way that we can enhance that indoor environment with color. Anybody want to find a blue car? In the parking garage to the left. So color can help in that area. The other is active controls in covered parking can do two things. One, they can save tremendous amounts of energy. The DOE finds that 90% of the time a covered parking space is unoccupied. Why burn the lights at 100% when there's nobody there? If we put a sensor on each one of those lights, we have an interesting thing that happens. Okay, dims down when nobody's around. But as a user in that space, what happens when I walk under? Fixture above me lights. So I call it, to, you light the victim instead of the criminal. So now, just like I am here, I'm in the light, and somebody could be in the peripheral where it's very, very dim. Do I feel safe? You know, people feel particularly vulnerable in, in covered parking areas. So we're saving energy, but we're creating an environment that's not, not a great experience to be in. So with newer technology, and even in a retrofit scenario, we can enable the fixtures with RF communication such that when one sensor finds someone, the entire field of view turns on. One hand, you could say, well, that's energy inefficient. I'm lighting the entire zone when I'm just at the beginning of the zone. But if you think about how that space gets used, when I drive through, what happens? I'm just going to sequentially trip sensor after sensor after sensor, and the whole floor is going to be lit when I'm through driving. Or if I'm walking from one side of the deck to the other to get to my car, I'm going to trip one sensor at a time. Eventually, the whole deck uh, goes on either as I walk through or as I drive away. So from an energy perspective, we can use the ability to individually control and tune those fixtures to save much more energy than we would have expended by having the lights on for a few seconds extra. Finally, tonight, I'd like to talk about a new frontier and a new technology of lighting related to visible light communication. And uh, I grew up in New England, and so uh, on the upper left uh, is a kind of a, a, an iconic image of, of uh, the main rocky coast where 
we set lighthouses so the ships could see see where the where the shoals were. Has anybody realized that, that the lighthouses along the coast spin at different frequencies? That way a mariner can tell which lighthouse they're near based on based on the frequency uh, of the spin. And, and, and lighthouses have been around a long time. Uh, the first one was built a couple of thousand years ago in, in Egypt. And it lasted for almost uh, 1,400 years, which is long even for LED standards. <laughs> but you, you look at that and you say, well, geez, that's kind of quaint. That's why do we have that? We have GPS, right? That's how we all get around today. And, and GPS works with uh, geosynchronous satellites that broadcast microwave energy and uh, picks it up on our mobile device and takes us from point A to point B. That's how I got from LaGuardia here today. And we're spoiled by that, right? You go to any city you want, plug in your address, and you'll find your way. However, the microwaves from GPS satellites don't make it inside buildings very well. So it's only an exterior navigation system. And so we're searching for ways that we can navigate the interior of buildings as well as, as, well as outside. And I'm not sure if folks have read, uh, when we walk into retail stores today, uh, retail stores are putting Wi-Fi routers at strategic points in the store. And your smartphone will link the router that's closest to you and it'll look at signal strength and as you walk through the store it'll transfer to the next router so uh, we're kind of being monitored where we walk and where we stand and where we dwell in, in retail environments today and Wi-Fi routers and, and the Wi-Fi connection on your phone at best can get you about five meters so within about 15 feet of anywhere uh, within a retail environment uh, Wi-Fi signal strength and triangulation will, will locate you. So it kind of tells you what department you're in, but that's about all. Uh, your, your phone is actually a mobile sensing platform. There's a dozen sensors on a smartphone today. Three accelerometers, light sensors, cameras or sensors, low energy Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and so there are systems out there, one by a company called Shopkick, uh, and they deploy a blanket of microphones through interior spaces. And even though you're not on your phone, your phone is listening to those microphones and locating you within the store. Uh, with a high density of, of microphones, uh, or excuse me, speakers, uh, activating the mic microphone on your phone at, at above uh, the range of human hearing. There's also, as I mentioned, low energy Bluetooth, uh, which is good for about 10 foot range as you walk from one department to the other. Uh, Bluetooth can, can locate you within the store. But the new frontier is actually using uh, light, invisible light communication as a positioning system within the retail environment. So if you choose, just like GPS, uh, to pull out your phone and navigate the store. The forward-facing camera on your phone will pick up the light from a nearby fixture and position you within the store. Unlike the other technologies, it's very friendly. You pull out your phone and you want to find something in the store. Okay. So it brings what I call people to product. So in this aisle, you know, where, you know, where are the, uh, where are the, uh, uh, where's the spray paint? Where's the uh, Rust-Oleum spray paint? Or it can bring people to people, and then you can ask, uh, I, I need some help in the store, and they can locate you exactly where you are. So why the lighting? In a retail environment, Lights are a very regular space grid at a very, very high density. They're only uh, you know, typically about uh, 10 or 12 feet on the center. You're already there. Lights are wherever people are. They're always powered. 
they're on whenever the store is open. They get deployed uh, as part of their normal course of construction, and you don't need any special placement. And every smartphone on the market today has a forward-facing camera. So it provides an ideal infrastructure for positioning within the store. Not only that, unlike those microphones that people would put out, the LED lighting saves money, cuts maintenance, and creates a better store appearance. So how does it work? The luminaire actually modulates a digital signal with light, so a very high frequency pulses of light come out, much higher frequency than the eye can perceive. That gets picked up by the forward-facing camera on the phone. And the phone interacts with a database, which is the store planogram, and provides you with all the information that is in the store in real time. And as part of the commissioning process of the lights, we locate the store, but the fixture within the big model of the store, uh, that creates the absolute position of the fixture and the relative position of the merchandise. So this is a brand new technology. Uh, it is just beginning to be deployed. But it's one way in which we think about lighting in different ways. So lighting in terms of illumination, lighting in terms of energy, lighting in terms of maintenance, but also lighting in terms of new services and new capabilities that LED can bring to the environment. So that's what we mean by evolving better solutions. Moving beyond just efficiency, just life of LEDs, and just the cost of LEDs into these new services and capabilities that LED can provide to enrich, enable, and enhance, all while using fewer resources. So thank you. I'll be here for any questions or anything anybody would like to ask in a few minutes. Is that something that Acuity is providing? Uh, we're going to demonstrate it. Uh, we have a technology partner who writes the algorithms on the smartphone. Uh, and then it's our technology inside the fixture that modulates the light, uh, that pushes it to the, to the phone. So uh, we're actually going to show that at Light Fair this year uh, as, a, as a new technology on the forefront lighting. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, well, Steve's going to stick around for a little bit if anybody has any questions. Um, one little housekeeping item. We have AIA, or Continued Education Credits, um, certificates back on the counter as you leave the gallery, as, lo as well as an AIA sign-in sheet if you want us to register your credits for you. Um, let's just get one more time for Steve.